Uh, well, good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, Port Baptist Church for our morning service. Apologies for the mess outside. I'm afraid that's the builder at work. And um, all the big white bags, I think, are the new flooring that's going to go down. Yeah. There we go. So, um, hopefully, that will, yes, you'll rectify all the mess at some stage. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I'll give a few notices before we uh, start the service proper. Um, as far as I know, Jenny is around, and tomorrow there will be a time yeah, waiting for God. That's in the afternoon. I think it's 2 3 o'clock. 3 o'clock? Is it 2 o'clock? 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. 2 o'clock. 3 o'clock. As far as I know, Wednesday still waters, uh, that's 10 till 12, uh, just a social time together, uh, chatting, and, uh, coffee and refreshments. Uh, I think leaders is this week, yeah. the afternoon, yes. 2 o'clock uh, leaders meeting here in the hall. Um, and uh, as far as I know, there'll be a prayer meeting and Bible study on Thursday morning. Yeah. That's 10 o'clock prayer meeting, half past 10. Bible study. We've got to about 1 Corinthians 5, five 6. Five, six yeah. Yeah. That's where we are with that. Um, the Bible so, study will be on Wednesday night. I, I, I'm not sure whether Katie and Jonathan they're are back. back. They're back today. Oh, they're coming back today. But well, we'll try and find out. And if, if they are, if their home is available, we'll, yeah, we'll yeah. meet. Okay. <laughs> um, stay and play on Friday. Good. Yeah, it's going well, as far as we know. As far as yeah. I know, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, next weekend, uh, next Sunday is Remembrance Sunday, and the service here with Communion, and also the, the usual the pr- parade, although the band are not marching this year. We're going to play outside the sun as the people march down, but they will have a drum and a side drum for the march. And then there's the remembrance service in St. Peter's. And that's from 10.30. 10.45, the service yeah. starts. And so. the parade is 10.15? Yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, and the, the, there'll be the usual two minute silence yep. at both services. 11 o'clock. Um, and so I know Peter's uh, taking the service here. Yeah. 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 Any other notices, advanced notices? Yeah. Does anybody lay claim to the two coats over there? Because they've been <laughs> in the hall for ages. Three coats, no. They'll go to the charity shop if they're not claimed soon. <laughs> so if anybody know. wants a coat, <laughs> <laughs> we could just put a label across the top. <laughs> <laughs> needs a good home. And as far as that, towards the end of this month, there's supposed to be uh, uh, a variety evening, it's, uh, just desserts, but we'll clarify that on, <laughs> on Wednesday because Jonathan not being around has not been able to organise it so we'll see how we get that we'll let you know. I think that's all the notices. Yeah. So we'll proceed with that service as well. We do give a warm welcome to Keith Disney uh, from St Peter's who's our preacher this morning. Good to see you. Thank you for coming in your willingness to uh, serve in this way. And we look forward to hearing what God says to us through you. I think God is, um, seems to be emphasising, we had a guest preacher last week, you don't know, they, they talked about prayer, so I think God is <laughs> saying something to us, isn't he, about prayer. Um, yeah. Let's just hope we agree. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> sure, sure, sure. As long as you stick to the word. <laughs> So, uh, by way of call to worship, some opening verses from Psalm 113. It starts with the word hallelujah, but it's, it's translated, Praise the Lord. Yes, give praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord, now and forever. Everywhere, from east to west, praise the name of the Lord. For the Lord is high above the nations, his glory is higher than the heavens. And um, we're going to 
stand and sing our opening hymn of praise, which is Crown Him with Many Crowns. Lord, 
to continue to trust you, that you are the Lord who is working his purposes out, that you are sovereign, that you reign, and that your kingdom will come on earth as it is in heaven. So Lord, we pray that you would be glorified, you would speak to us through your word, and help us to be better equipped and uh, strengthened for the challenges of the days to come. So we, we bring our prayers and praise together in that pattern prayer that Jesus gave, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. I've meditating, if you're rolling um, over in my mind uh, the, the, the different times, things that have happened in history and in the world. Um, and I was thinking about John, the, um, the disciple John, and um, towards the end of his life, you know, he was, uh, there was a lot of persecution going on in the church. Christians were being put to death horribly. And he was um, uh, exiled on Patmos, um, in terms of exile. And towards the end, he met, he met, I'm sure by then, most of his colleagues, uh, fellow disciples, had been martyred. All this trouble was going on. He, he was wondering what's what's the what's happening in the world. He's got still in control, and God very lovely and graciously for him and for us gave him this wonderful revelation, uh, a fresh vision of who Jesus is in His glory, um, and then um, an insight into what God has, His purposes, His plans. And basically, as somebody said, good wins out in the end. Um, Satan is defeated and sin is destroyed and death. Um, so that's really the, the uh, book of Revelation. Um, but it begins with this fantastic vision of uh, the risen and glorified Jesus. I'll uh, just read a little bit. Um, so it's uh, Revelation 1, verses 5b. There we go. He is the faithful witness to these things, the first to rise from the dead, the ruler of, of all the kings of the world. All glory to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by shedding his blood for us. He has made us a kingdom of priests for God, his Father. All glory and power to him forever and ever. Look, he comes with the clouds of heaven, and everyone will see him, even those who pierced him. And all the nations of the world will mourn for, for him. Yes, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord. I am the one who is, who has all who always was and who is still to come, the Almighty One. And in verses 12, Then I turned to see who was speaking to me. I saw seven gold lampstands, and standing in the middle of the lampstands was someone like the Son of Man. He was wearing a long robe with a gold sash across his chest. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flames of fire. His feet were like polished bronze, refined in the furnace, and his voice thundered like, might, like mighty ocean waves. He held seven stars in his hand, and a sharp two-edged sword came from his mouth, and his face was like the sun in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as if I were dead. 
and then Jesus ministers to him. Um, but it, in the midst of all this trouble and violence and destruction and pain, um, we probably have the, the questions like um, uh, John did, what's it all about? Is God still sovereign? And that's the reassurance, God is still in control. So we come to worship the Lord Jesus, and we have a group of three songs, All Heaven Declares, As Your Feet We Fall, and Jesus Shall Take the Highest Honor. So feel free to stand or to sit, prostrate yourselves, or whatever <laughs> uh, you feel led to do. <laughs>
Amen. <laughs> well, yes. The notes took us into the heavens, didn't it? So, the next song. <laughs> the, the other thing that we notice in the, that, that John was reassured of is that there is continued worship in heaven, and he has a glimpse of that. Um, Jesus shall take the highest honor. We'll sing that. Perhaps one or two lead us out. We worship, Lord. We, we try it with our voices, Lord, but we, uh, <laughs> we can't reach the heavens. <laughs> Lord, we thank you that you are preparing a place for us. And we thank you one day we shall join with that great multitude that no one could number, worshipping before your throne. What a privilege, Lord. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
scripture, a picture, a testimony, something God has said to you in the week. Don't feel pressure. Yeah. 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 Um, it's just over a year since Howard passed away and it's his birthday this month so it's on my mind but two things have happened this week that made me sort of think not differently but more um, I met somebody at, at uh, Stillwaters that I've, I've known on and off for years um, since our children I think were in um, Mons and Tots at Bunbury Baptist Church so that's you know probably 35, 40 years ago, um, and uh, she's recently widowed, about a month later than that. Um, she, she would believe that she was a Christian, but she didn't seem to have that reassurance. She said her husband was a Christian, so that, you know, this is just a short part of our lives on earth, and we've got so much more to hope for in heaven. And her husband, like my husband, were, were very weak towards the end, totally unwell. Um, and, you know, how I certainly believed that he had something better to go for. And, and I find that incredibly reassuring that um, as he got weaker, there was something to move on to. And, and we spoke about that. And then I met somebody I used to work with at the fair yesterday, the craft fair. She lost her husband two years ago. In a sense, similar circumstances. The three husbands had similar health problems, but her husband had dementia too, towards the end. And she was still very tied up in grief. Um, and I just felt we, we should just do so much more to talk to other people about hope in the future. That, you know, that for her it was a huge loss and she, she didn't seem to get, get her head around the fact that for him it was a release. Because you know, he was by that time in a home um, with severe health difficulties. And, and we, I don't know. I know that I'm I'm not an evangelist. I'm a sort of carer, but I'm not an evangelist. It doesn't come naturally to me at all. But I'm being put in these situations now that I can talk with some um, strength, if you like, or reality about what it means to be a Christian. And I just think, you know, if we need to be fired up. We need to pray for the Holy Spirit to really speak through us in these circumstances, that that we can tell people what Christianity means to us. And the difference it makes. Yes, I, I guess that does. You know, we've had a difficult week, Jane, particularly a friend of her uh, that she's a, was a colleague at the college where she used to teach, and then um, has sat out at the food bank. Her husband uh, died of heart, heart failure. Yeah, no, just yeah. um, and as far as we know. They don't have, but either of them have any faith. And it's, it's a contrast, you say, between those of us who know the Lord and have the promises of God. Um, as, as Paul says, there are those who are in the world without hope, without God. Uh, they're lost. It, 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 no, no future hope at all. But the, part of the major part of the good news is we have an eternal hope and a promise. Um, of heaven. Yes. So, yes. But, uh, thank you, Rosemary, for that. Anyone else talk before we go? Want to share from there? Or? Yeah, I'll share from here. Um, I was going to say, I've noticed the last year in particular that God's definitely been there for me, um, whether it wants it or not, good or bad, He's there. <laughs> so, it's, it helps me to, I know if I'm sinning. Which I haven't been. He, he, he knows. See, there ain't no lying from God. He knows if you've been good or bad, like you. So I just, I don't know, I feel blessed because he's helped me out with accidents, jobs, all sorts. It's, it's saved me from a lot without me even realising. And I've looked back and forth. This week I've had cathartic clean out. Someone said to me, you know, there are no bags in heaven. You can't, all these possessions. I'm sat there looking at the past got rid of some of it and it makes me feel better to live in the present where I know I'm a race in Christianity and you know, before I wasn't a Christian so and I do show my cross to a lot of people when I'm out and you know it's not Christmas fair 
I was out yesterday, I didn't buy any Santa nonsense. <laughs> so I just don't, I can't bring myself to do that anymore because it's not about Santa. So that's all I wanted to say. I'm slowly becoming a nice Christian. <laughs> <laughs> a true Christian. <laughs> <laughs> Christmas wasn't a nice time for us children growing up anyway, it's all not never very really nice, so yeah, anyway, that's all I'll say. Thanks, that's great. We, um, we were listening to a, a little bit of a phone in on Radio 4, I think it was Tuesday, mm -hmm. and it was about um, how, how people are going to cope with Christmas this year mm -hmm. because of the cost of living crisis, and it was kind of, how, how can we afford Christmas? You're we thinking, well, is there a set amount then you have to, you know, <laughs> to spend at Christmas? You know, are we under obligation? No, you, you adjust your budget, don't you, to your circumstances. You know, don't go into debt. And, yeah, so you still buy a little gift and yeah, express your, your love for your, your family and your friends. Yeah, but there we go. Pressures. And, we're going to turn to um, prayers of intercession now. Is that folks, we need to pray for Pam, uh, situation. Pray for Dorothy. She'll be guided to the right place for uh, mm -hmm. care. Um, yeah, could I'm you need to pray I'm for Liz on the way. Liz, um, what's her name? Wyatt. Yes. And she comes to still waters. But yeah. her friend Judy is very poorly. Oh, Judy was taken back to hospital again this right. morning. Oh. So Liz is quite upset. And uh, uh, lift up uh, Kim, I think he's not too well, she's having various tests and things. Um, yeah, pray for, for Peter and for Kim, the future there. And of course the world, we're just overwhelmed with I mean, what's going on. We can't change anything other than to pray, and pray that the, the peace will prevail there in uh, the Middle East. So let's, let's come to prayer. Lead, and then I'll give an opportunity for anyone to pray. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we can come to you, bring those things, Lord, that would cause us to worry and to fear and be a burden to us. We thank you we can come with confidence to your throne of grace and find help in time of need. So, Lord, we come to you for our fellowship pray that you continue to guide us and provide for our needs, help us to see the way ahead, Lord, as we seek you for the future, for ourselves here as a fellowship and for Peter and for Kim mm -hmm. as they uh, move towards retirement. And we pray, continue to pray for the building, this restoration project that it would, uh, the builder would do a good job there would be safety on the side and you would help us to cope with the mess. Thank you for those that have given and that uh, we pray, Lord, that we will stay on budget. Uh, we dare to pray, Lord, that at the end of this project we'll be debt-free. Lord, you, you can do it and we ask that you would do that, show your faithfulness. Pray for Pam, Lord, be with her in her time of need and frailty. Um, pray for those who are caring for her and for family. They will work together for her good. We pray for Dorothy and pray that Lord you would help her by your spirit to discern in the right place for her to make her home the future. Give her your peace, Lord. Keep her from worrying and fretting and being anxious and fearful. Help her to just rest and to trust in you and to know your peace. And we pray for this Wyatt's uh, friend, for uh, Lord, who's in Judy, is it? Judy was in hospital or in the and We thank you again for the NHS and for all who help medically. Uh, pray that they would be wise in the treatment that they give and it would be for her good and for her benefit. And Lord, we just bring to you this uh, troubled world. Lord, we we become can become distressed if we would watch too much of the news and stuff that's going on in Gaza and in Israel. And we 
we just long to see peace there, Lord, that the destruction and the violence and the killing would stop. And Lord, there would be an end to evil there. Lord, help us to trust you, Lord, that you work through these situations and that your good and your righteousness will overcome evil and destruction. We dare, we pray, Lord, as we pray, your kingdom come. Come, Lord Jesus, now and after. Come soon. So, Lord, hear our prayers now as we continue before you. Those, those, say quietly in our hearts and never spoken aloud. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Today is the day of international prayer for the persecuted church. Mm -hmm. And Lord, with all what's going on elsewhere in the world, it's easy to forget so many people are suffering. <coughs> they love you. One in seven Christians are persecuted across the world mm -hmm. in various forms, Lord. And we just want to remember all of them mm -hmm. before you, whether they're in prison, whether they've been mm -hmm. hounded out of their villages, whether they've had to become refugees because of their love for you. We just pray and ask, Lord, that they would know your presence in a real tangible way today. And we thank you that when you move people out of situations, often your church flourishes. And I thank you that in, in um, cases from Af Afghanistan where people have had to move out, that there were churches thriving in, in other parts of the world through Afghans. So we just thank you for that, Lord. Mm -hmm. But we do pray that there would be an end to all this constant hatred of Christians. And just hatred in general, Lord. Mm -hmm. It's the hatred that we see in people's eyes and in all the situations of war that is so awful to cope, to cope with. Mm -hmm. So we pray for the end of that. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. to sing prayers together now. It is, uh, Father, I place into your hands. Uh, yeah. I think I've told you before, this was written by the daughter of a London city missionary. Jean Hewer. Perhaps you'd like to stand for this, would you? Father, I place into your hands the things I cannot do. Father, I place into your hands the things that I may do.
commit to it, so you can take up the offer. <laughs> <laughs> can we do that now? We'll let off for just. of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, my Lord, my rock, my redeemer. Amen. Amen. It is nice to be here, actually, and it's nice that you made me feel so welcome. You've left the front row empty, <laughs> where I would expect back across the road or at any one of the churches in the benefice. But it's nice 
to be so close to you. I can see the whites of your eyes, <laughs> and maybe in a few moments I might see the pinks of your eyelids. <laughs> I hope not. Anyway, thank you for bringing me here. Um, it's good to be here and to be able to share with you. I gather you had a talk on prayer last week. <laughs> Well, I'm going to focus a bit more on the Lord's Prayer, but firstly I also need to say uh, apologies for anybody who listens to Steve Bethesden, his breakfast show on UCB1 in the mornings. He's had a guest speaker talking about the Lord's Prayer all week. But these are my thoughts, they're not his thoughts. I've not pinched his words at all. <laughs> and also apologies if you're expecting a sort of wishy-washy, ten-minute, people-pleasing, Anglican sermon. <laughs> That's not my style. I like to offer a little bit of a challenge when I talk, if only it's a challenge to me. But I did hear that you liked a little bit more substance. Or is it length? <laughs> but you needn't worry about your Sunday roast. I'm not going to talk or speak about the Lord's Prayer word by word. I'm actually going to just reflect on a few thoughts from it, otherwise we'll still be here next Sunday. And when I was younger, very much younger, and a young Christian spiritually as well, I heard somebody talking on the topic of prayer. Of course, being so long ago, I can't remember that much, but his introduction struck with, stuck with me. He gave an exaggerated example of pompous public prayer that could have come straight from the Pharisee's Guide to Praying Dummies book. <laughs> if you've read the Dummies book, you know what I mean. It's something a bit like, Most gracious Heavenly Father, Creator of all life in heaven and on earth, Author of all good things, we are not worthy to offer you our humble praise. However, we do ask that you undertake for our poor brother who's laid on one side in a bed of sickness. <laughs> undertake? He doesn't need an undertaker. He needs somebody to change his bedclothes and get rid of his sickness. You know what I mean. The Pharisees were known for their formulaic, crowd-centred praying, as well as their highly public displays of piety and humbleness. That's the exact opposite of what Jesus was teaching. And he gives us a clue in verse 5, so that they may be seen by others. Do we pray that we might be seen by others? No. They weren't praying to God, but they were praying to gain praise from the people. And our Lord, in contrast, we read throughout the Gospels that Jesus prayed quietly and alone and definitely not to the crowd. But before we look into the Lord's Prayer in a little bit more detail, I want to make a couple of general comments. It's not the only example of prayer in the Bible. And I go back again to my youth when somebody talked to me about Nehemiah. He was, dad, sorry, he was deeply saddened by the news from Jerusalem. Sounds a little bit familiar at the moment. And according to Nehemiah, he sat down and wept for days fasting and praying for God alone. And then a few moments later in chapter 2, we read that when King Artaxerxes, don't you just love that name? <laughs> yes, I can see John does. Um, <laughs> yes, yes. When King Artaxerxes, he said, I can say it twice, <laughs> asked him why he was so sad. I prayed to the God of heaven and then I said to the king, and we've just gone from one extreme to the other, weeping and fasting and a quick arrow to a quick arrow prayer, both between Nehemiah and God only. And I'm not advocating that we go fasting for days on end. For one thing, I'd be a hypocrite. And secondly, because I'm not convinced that excess fasting is good for you. For many of us, when we recite the same prayer, such as the Lord's Prayer, it can become a habit. And habit breeds complacency. Not that we should overthink our prayer time either. It's a time to be still and quiet and to listen to God, to 
20% praying and 80% listening. It's been said that 80% of prayers go unanswered because we spend 80% of the time praying. But if we spend 80% of the time listening to God, then 80% of our prayers would be answered. But what's all this got to do with the Lord's Prayer? Well, I believe the Lord's Prayer is not an instruction, but it's a framework, a template. And like all good frameworks, it's got a structure. It's broadly in three sections. Recognition of who God is, supplication or asking, and then a final doxology or time of praise, which actually was added later. We've heard two versions of the Lord's Prayer this morning. We had the traditional version earlier on, which we all prayed together, and then John read a much more modern version. I've actually used the contemporary Anglican version of the prayer when I've been preparing, but it's not that different. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. And there's two things to note here. Firstly, it's about putting God first. Hallowed means greatly revered and to be honoured. That's a bit more than just praised. Greatly to be revered and honoured. God is the creator of heaven and the earth. He's our creator. And I get excited each time scientists dis discover something new about the living world. It's amazing. They think they're so clever, but it's been there all the time, designed and created by our Father in Heaven, who therefore should be greatly revered and honoured. Hallowed be his name. Our natural world has an order to it, from the smallest cell or microbe right up to that amazing machine that we call the human body. From T cells to find infection, to the predators and grazers that keep nature in its balance. Creation works in perfect harmony. Why wouldn't we revere and honour its architect? But there's something else to note in, in this. Our Father implies we're praying together, corporately as well as in private. With corporate prayer, you might argue that the 80-20 rule doesn't apply, but that would be a mistake. I've used the word corporately, deliberately. It's not about our leaders or our prayer warriors praying in the place of us. This may, oh sorry, they may say the words, but we need to engage in their prayers with our hearts, not wondering how long it will be before they finish or thinking about our Sunday lunch. Another example from my youth. Many years ago, I went to a Pentecostal church to see what it was like. And when the woman behind me shouted hallelujah as we were praying, I just jumped out of my skin. <laughs> but now, I realise that she and the others with their more muted amens were engaging in the prayers. They were praying corporately as one body. And dare I say, it's why in the Anglican church, we intersperse our prayers with a congregational response. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And it is in our typical British way. Second part of the Lord's Prayer is the bit about asking or supplication. Your kingdom come, your will be done. You got it? You okay with that? But when do we expect his kingdom to come? 10.30 on a Sunday morning here? When we're having our quiet time, perhaps? Or when we go away to somewhere like Spring Harvest? And it goes on earth as it is in heaven. Of course, now we get it. Jesus must have meant the second coming. No, I don't think he did at all. If it's the second coming, then why do we have so many churches worldwide adopting the phrase, thy kingdom come, as their prayer theme for that time between Ascension and Pentecost. They're not praying for the second coming, they're praying for today. Pentecost is when Christ appeared to the early Christians. 
It follows his ascension to heaven, not his return. It's praying for specific people, family, friends, neighbours, to come to faith in Christ, and thus growing God's kingdom on earth. I'm sure many of us have come away from a particularly uplifting time of worship and prayer, like Spring Harvest. We've been surrounded by brothers and sisters in Christ, feeling that what heaven is like, then we should bring it on now. It's sad, but that feeling tends to evaporate when we get home and back into reality. And that's why we should be praying, Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. We should be seeking to know and to do God's will. Your will will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We're praying for that to be done now in our daily lives, not at some unknown point in the future. Why can't we have that feeling when we're doing the washing up or cooking supper? But with the help of the Holy Spirit we can, and that is what we're praying for. Thy kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. In the next bit we are praying for ourselves. Give us today our daily bread. And it's interesting to me that Asking for daily bread comes before asking for forgiveness. It's not the only time that Jesus is concerned for our physical well-being. He knows we need to be nourished in order to function properly, both physically and mentally, and certainly before we can function properly at our best spiritually. Jesus isn't a head in the crowd, super spiritual kind of guy. He's a practical, down-to-earth kind of guy. God as man on earth. And that's why he's criticising the Pharisees for their pompous ways, playing to the crowd and full of their own self-importance. It's daily bread, not bread for next week. Bread sufficient for our immediate needs. Look what happened to the Israelites in the wilderness when they tried to gather more manna than they needed for the day. It became inedible, full of worms, although you might like worms. Would well, you remember back in the days of Covid, not that long ago, when people thought that they would run out of toilet paper? I bet there's some folks still who are working their way through a stockpile of some sort. It's a comment about greed. We become focused on over-providing for ourselves, grabbing for ourselves and ignoring those around us. We lose sight of Christ's love for us all. Jesus reinforces that message later in the Sermon on the Mount, not once but twice. In verses 19 to 21, do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. It's not greed. We're praying for our daily bread, sufficient for our needs today. Verses 25 to 33, we get that lovely passage that tells us not to worry. Look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Give us our daily bread our bread for today, not for the next month, the next six years. That passage ends with strive first for the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be given to you as well. Ah, that's sounding a bit like your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. To me it's sounding like the same prayer, the Lord's Prayer. Now we get to forgiveness. Forgives our sins as though we forgive those who sin against us. It's my belief that forgiveness is the most important theme in the Bible. God leads the way by forgiving our sins. If you look at the other Gospels, the Lord's Prayer also appears in abbreviated form in Luke 11, a mark with an even shorter, wherever you stand praying, forgive. If you have anyone, anything against anyone, so that your Father in heaven 
may also forgive you your trespasses. Forgiveness. No more, no less. Forgiveness is important because if we fail to forgive others, it can hinder our own forgiveness. I'm going back to the various versions. I prefer the traditional version where it says trespasses, not sins. Sin is too black and white. It can be justified with statements like, I did it for his own good, or it was only a little white lie she won't notice. Trespassing is more in inclusive. It's more invasive. When we trespass, we encroach on others. We take advantage of them. She never knew, but we still trespassed upon her. We can't wriggle out of trespassing when we think we know best. Last week, we celebrated all souls, remembering our loved ones who are no longer with us. The Sermon on the Mount again. Blessed are those that mourn, for they should be comforted. But peace and comfort will be difficult to achieve without having forgiveness. Forgiving someone who perhaps is no longer with us. Paul, the Apostle, further emphasises the importance in Colossians. As God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness and patience. There's not a lot wrong there, is there? We can all try and do that. The difficult bit comes next. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you must also forgive. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Oscar Wilde once said, the only thing I can't resist is temptation. <laughs> Our Lord knew what it was like to be tempted, so it's no surprise that he includes it here. It's a fact of life. Temptation happens, but it's also a fork in the road, and we have a choice. By praying, lead us not into temptation. We are asking that we are led down the fork, from away from a temptation, and towards Christ. John 14, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. So lead us on the way, away from temptation, the way that leads us to life. We're nearly there. The final section is one of praise, acknowledging that the kingdom, the power and the glory are the Lord's. It's why we pray, thy kingdom come on earth, give us this day our daily bread, forgive us our sins. It may have been added later, but it gives meaning and purpose to the prayer. And not only that, it neatly bookends with hallowed be your name. Praise and praise and glory to the Lord. So to sum up, prayer is personal between us and God, it, but it's both private and it is corporate. And if it's corporate, we should engage with the prayer, not waiting passively to say Amen at the end. You might not feel like leaping up and shouting Amen or Hallelujah, but your minds shouldn't wander either. The Lord's Prayer begins with praise and ends with praise, very deliberately. It's there to remind us of who we are praying to. And forgiveness is important if we are to receive forgiveness ourselves. We're all Familiar, I know. Too familiar, perhaps, with the Lord's Prayer. So my challenge to you this week, or even today, is to take some time to revisit it. Go into your room, close your door, and read it aloud, slowly, repeating each phrase two, three, maybe four times, praying to your Heavenly Father, 
And my prayer is that we will all discover it anew. Amen. Thank you, Keith. Uh, one or two, I think we were going to hear, but uh, a few weeks ago, Roy came to the service. Mm-hmm. He used to come here and he apparently goes to all the churches. And it's one of the things he was very keen, encouraged me when he first came, uh, can we have the Lord's Prayer every Sunday? As, as we don't have that tradition, you know, that the Anglicans do. You know? But uh, yeah, it's, for me now, it's become, I always include it in the service because it's so helpful. Thank you, Keith, for reminding us of that. And, um, yeah, so part of me was thinking, perhaps we should now close with um, what a friend we have in Jesus, all our sins and Christ to bear. What a privilege to carry everything to God in prayer. But I chose, actually, I think it's a prayer in itself. It's the hymn, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, Forgive Our Foolish Ways. And it's... Um, he, the man who wrote this was a Quaker, a Quaker, and he's writing, uh, it's, he wrote it, I think, verse, um, in response to the turmoil and foolishness he saw amongst the, the worship of the Native Indians in America, uh, when they dance around and get into a frenzy, and he was thinking, oh God, you know, we clothe us in our rightful mind. <laughs> um, and at the end of it, he recalls, and uh, I've just finished a study personally, in um, Elijah. Uh, remember, after the great uh, uh, victory, conquest on Mount Carmel? Yeah. Uh, he hears the news um, Ahab's wife. Jezebel. Jezebel says, um, I'm going to get. I'm going to kill you. And he runs away, you know, remember the story? And he's absolutely exhausted at the end of himself. He's really depressed. He says, I will take my life. He wants to die. And God meets with him, minister, the angels minister to him. But then he's taken up to the mountain and it's this, uh, God meets with him. Remember the incident, it's the wind that comes, passes by, and the earthquake and the fire. And he, then, and it's a phrase that's really helped me because we've seen so much of that in the world, the natural world. Earthquake, wind and fire. It says God is not in the earthquake. He's not in the wind, not in the fire. But he's that still, small voice. And I pray that we will all be conscious of that still, small voice speaking to us each day of our lives. So that's my thinking behind choosing this as our final song.
still small voice, your peace, your calm, into our lives and into this troubled world. And now may the blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit be with us all this day and evermore. Amen.